Just allow that awareness to be fully present right here. And allow that awareness to merge with your breath. As you take the inhalations and exhalations, slowly and deeply, And as you inhale, allow yourself to take in not just oxygen, but you're taking in a sacred energy. You're taking in this holy prana, this life force. And it's an energy that is blowing from across the tops of the Himalayas and from over the waters of Mother Ganga. It's that same prana that has been breathed by the sages and the saints and the rishis and yogis. And allow yourself to take it in. Allow it to touch and awaken and infuse every cell of your being, every cell of your physical body and also of your energetic body. Feel that sacred prana come in. Slowly bring the palms of your hands together at chest level in Namaste. And gently rub the palms of your hands against each other. And press those palms of your hands into your closed eyes. Slowly and gently, lower the hands and open your eyes. Welcome to Satsang. So beautiful to be, to be together with you all in this beautiful garden. Is there a way? But yeah, you peachy while he lights you. Hey, chill out, Sakti. It's just nice. They'll get the lights on, then I can see those of you in the back also. As as usual, we we start with a question that has come in advance from our family joining us from all over the world, who are joining in from online, watching the live stream, and. We start with one question from them just out of love because they can't actually be with us here on the banks of Ganga. And then after that first question, we 
we'll open it up to any questions that anyone here might have. What is the quickest way to break free of old patterns and behaviors? I am feeling so stuck. And that's from our family member Winifred in Newcastle on Tyne in England. The best way to break free of old patterns of thought, of action, is actually just to start with new patterns. It's very difficult to push something away into just emptiness. We can do it, but it's harder. It's why you'll notice when people work to quit smoking, they start chewing gum. Something to do with the mouth instead of smoking. Then slowly, slowly they learn to give up the chewing gum also. But... This idea of giving yourself something to do instead of the bad habit makes things actually easier. So in the same way, if my mind has a habit of going in a certain direction, it's one thing to just stop that. But it's slightly easier if instead of simply stopping that altogether... I actively direct my mind someplace else. So if I say to you right now, okay, for just a moment, I want you to think about getting to Delhi. Okay? Just in your mind, think for a moment about getting to Delhi. All the ways you could get to Delhi, what it would be like if you got to Delhi. Now, if I suddenly say to you, okay, stop thinking about getting to Delhi. Stop thinking about Delhi. You're actually going to find it a bit difficult. Even though you've only been thinking about Delhi for 30 seconds, not 30 years. Simply because in even those 30 seconds, the mind got a bit habituated to thinking about it. But if I say to you, okay, now, instead of thinking about getting to Delhi, think about getting to Paris. Think about Paris instead of Delhi. All the ways you might get there, what it would be like when you got there. So you see how that's a little easier. Now suddenly you're not thinking about Delhi. Because I gave you something different to do. When I simply said stop thinking about Delhi, it was hard because the mind kind of goes to Karunkya, what should I do instead? And it's going to go to where it's familiar. And the most recent familiar thing in that case was Delhi. But if you think about our lifetimes of patterns of thought, what we call sanskaras, in science we speak about them as neural networks or patterns. Spiritually we think about them as sanskaras, kind of impressions on our psyche. Rather than just immediately trying to stop it, give yourself something different. So for example, if your mind goes into judgment and negativity, and you say, don't be negative. And so every time the mind has a negative thought, you say, stupid, don't do that. I told you not to be negative. But now you see how I got negative anyway? In my reaction to trying to stop my mind from being negative, what did I do? I got negative anyway. One minute maybe I was negative about someone else, thinking, oh, that person is ugly, or that person is stupid, or that person this. But when I catch myself doing it, I get angry at myself, and I say, look at you. You're a spiritual failure. Look at you, you're so negative, you're such a bad person. You're failing spirituality. Now I'm just being negative about myself. I'm still being negative. But if instead, 
If instead I actually give myself a task, and the task is whomever I meet, the first thing I'm going to do long before any negative thought or judgment may come, immediately upon seeing them, I'm going to start looking for things that are beautiful. First, of course, it'll probably be on the outside because I don't know them. Maybe they have beautiful eyes or beautiful hair or a beautiful smile. Maybe their voice is beautiful. Maybe I like their accent, whatever it may be. But then as I start to talk to them, I'm going to start being able to notice deeper and deeper things about them. But see, I've given myself a task. Something to do other than the negative judgment. Same thing with habits. If you notice that every day you get up and the first thing you do is you scroll the news. And then you're depressed before you even get out of bed. Now it's one thing to just say, okay, from now on, no more news in the morning. But then you wake up and the mind goes, Karunkya, what should I do? And it's so easy to just immediately get into that pattern. Because we don't know what else to do. I have no other habit, nothing else that I'm used to doing when I wake up. But instead, if I say every day, the moment you get up, think of five things you're grateful for. The minute you get up, five things you're grateful for. And then sit for meditation. If you want to go to the bathroom and freshen up in the meantime, you can do that. And then just immediately sit for meditation. So you see, suddenly now there's no time to get on your phone. Immediately you wake up, it's a gratitude practice. And then it's your meditation. So it's not a matter that the mind has to have this willpower of no news, no news. But rather I've just given it a different way of starting the day. And then you keep giving it different things, different things, different things. So the easiest way of breaking free from habits of thought, of speech, of action is just to give yourself a new habit. And as you focus on that, the old one dissipates. You know, you think about it if, well, maybe we'll use this pillow. If you say that this is, let's call this a piece of stone. If I took my fingernail or a key or a coin and I kept going in one line over and over and over again here, I would get a groove. There would literally become an indentation in the stone. And then every time I poured water over it, or in nature it rains, this is how valleys are created. Every time it rains, then, where's the water going to go? In the groove. Because it's deeper. So all the water now is going to come here in the groove. And as the water comes in the groove, what's it going to do? Make it deeper. So as the groove gets deeper, then more water is going to come. The more water that comes, the deeper it gets. That groove is a pattern in your mind. It is literally a sanskara, an impression in our neurologic, electric, energetic way of thinking, our brains. So instead of just yelling at the water every time I pour it, don't go there, don't go there. Well, it's not going to work because that's where the groove is. Of course it's going to go there. Instead, you just start creating a new groove over here new groove and you make this one deeper and deeper and for a while the water will go kind of half this way, half that way. But as this one gets deeper, if you imagine that instead of a, a rock, it's a valley that's, you know, alive. Well, what happens with river valleys where, where rivers stop flowing in the valley? Slowly, slowly, slowly over many, many, many years. The valley starts regenerating. It's no longer quite so deep. Bushes come, then trees come. Slowly, slowly, it's no longer a deep river valley. And where the river is flowing, that gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And it's the exact same thing in our minds. 
So just lay a new habit. Lay a new groove. Yeah. Other questions? Any any questions that anyone here has? Yes. How does uh, one navigate life without a guru? Without a guru. How does one navigate life without a guru? Very difficultly from my personal experience and opinion. It's like, it's like saying, you know, you're in... A brand new house, not the house that you've always lived in. Brand new house. Lots of furniture, lots of rooms. You wake up in the middle of the night. You've got to go to the bathroom. You've got no flashlight. No phone that's got a light. There's no light in the house. How do you find it? Very difficultly. It's very likely that you're going to trip on something. You might fall, stub your toe, hurt yourself. I once fell down an entire flight of stairs, actually, in Australia. Luckily, I didn't hurt myself too much, but looking for the bathroom in the middle of the night, and instead of turning right to the bathroom, I turned left, and lo and behold, it was a staircase. And Life is like that. Most of us don't remember our past lives. Most of us don't come onto earth saying, oh, I know exactly the way to go. I've done this before. For most of us, even though we may know that we've been here before, it feels like the first time. Everything we experience, everything we learn, everything we do, it's, it feels like it's the first time. And so we're literally, we're, we're essentially in the dark without a map, without a light, doing the best we can. But that's actually why a guru is so important. Because the guru is the one who brings the light on the path, who shows us, who shows us where to go, but even more importantly, who shows us who we are. Because when we know who we are, we start to be able to find that path more easily. So without a guru, I would say the first thing is find one as soon and as, as quickly as possible. And until then, you know, we've been blessed with a lot of gurus. There's a lot of teaching out there. And these days, one of the benefits of technology, one of the benefits of this digital revolution, is actually that now so much is available and accessible wherever you are. I mean, here we are being joined by people all over the world, right? Who, for whatever reason, can't be here in Rishikesh right now with us. But wherever they are, they're actually able, through just this little camera thing, to be with us. And you're able now, through this incredible technology, to get onto a computer, onto a phone, And to actually get the wisdom of gurus, of mystics, of yogis, of rishis, of sages who maybe aren't even in their bodies anymore, but whose teachings are available online, either a video or something written. So in a way, if you look at history, it's actually the best time to be struggling because there's so many, so much wisdom that's accessible and available to you. And yet that can also be a downside because then the question becomes, oh my God, who do I listen to? Like where, who, which one, what's right? And again, that would bring me back to try to find a guru who's alive in their body, it 
just makes it easier. I know I get a lot of beautiful wisdom and teaching from masters who are no longer in their body. And I am so extraordinarily grateful, like immeasurably grateful, to have my guru here in his body, to be able to be in proximity so that he can guide me and pay attention. The dilemma, the dilemma with not having a guru is that our ego is so smart. It's so smart. And its games are so good that that ego will convince you of anything. Of anything. I cannot tell you the things that my own ego has tried to convince me of, the things that people have told me. Oh yeah, you know, I... My higher intuition, my inner voice has told me X, Y, Z. And I listen to it and I think, oh my God. Like this is why you need a guru. Because look, look at where the voice of ignorance, of illusion takes us. But convincing us that it's the voice of wisdom because there's no guru in a body to whom you say, hey, I've got this great idea. And who says, what are you thinking? One of my personal favorite moments, I mean, it didn't feel favorite at the time, but in retrospect, it's a favorite moment, was when Pooja Swamiji said to me, he said, you are the stupidest smart person I've ever met. Meaning, how can you, seemingly so intelligent, Seemingly so well educated, actually still have this way of thinking that is so incorrect. But if I didn't have somebody saying that to me, I would have thought, huh, this is the right way of thinking. So find that light the very best you can along the way, checking in every minute, every moment with that ego, but also try to find a guru as quickly as you can. Yeah, yes. Dedo, jaldi mi. Thank you, so pleased to be here. Um, My question is, I know that love exists only within ourselves, inside, and there's nowhere else to be found. So once you find your self-love, if so, there is existing, like, divine union. Ah, beautiful. If if there's a union, how do you know it's a union, that person? How do you define that's the union? Hmm. Beautiful. So... If love, real love, only exists in us and not in another person, after we find that inner self-love, when we then find another person and it feels like divine union, how do we know? So first of all, you're absolutely right, and it's important to reiterate I always say love, love exists in you. Other people may catalyze it through someone else. You may have the beautiful experience of discovering love inside. Having as a young boy said here about being here that his, the switch inside his heart was turned from off to on. Right? Something, something may catalyze it. But ultimately that love manufacturing plant, the love factory, is inside you. Now once you experience that, now when you're with another person, how do you know if it's real divine union? If it's divine union, you will feel expansive. 
So you will feel like with that person, your very experience of self expands. That you are able to experience more, feel more, identify as more within you. If it's just passion or lust or attachment or need, we contract. Real love and divine union is expansive. My very experience of myself, of my own heart, of my truth, of my consciousness, of my awareness, of my presence, it expands and expands through that divine union. Where it's lust and attachment, it contracts. Because then it just becomes all about what you did, what I want, what you're giving, what you're not giving, what you said. I need this, I need that. Right? It's very contractive. Passion and lust is all about, we've got blinders on, right? It becomes all, I need it now, I need it now, I need it now. It's very, very narrow. Love is expansive. So tune into yourself and ask yourself, is my experience of myself more expansive through this union? Or do I find myself more contracting into fear and attachment, need? Then it's not the right one. Commitment. Commitment. Absolutely. It's very difficult to have anything meaningful in life without commitment. There must be commitment. If I don't commit to getting up every day and meditating, you can be pretty sure it's not going to happen. If I just say, yeah, well, every day, we'll see every morning how I feel. If you don't already have a deep meditative practice, You can be pretty sure that how you're going to feel every morning is like turning over and going back to sleep. If you just leave it up to, ah, let's see, let's see what's in the flow of my morning when my alarm goes off at 4 o'clock. Without a commitment, most people's flow is just to hit the snooze button and roll over and go right back to sleep. It's only a commitment that makes me get up. If I make a commitment to taking care of my health, I'm going to stop eating sugar or eat less sugar. I'm going to go vegetarian. Or I'm going to exercise. Without a commitment? No, we'll start tomorrow. No, next week is good. Right? Ah, it's just one cookie, who cares? I mean, without a commitment, we don't do anything. Think about your work. Think about school. Think about anything that has ever been meaningful in your life in terms of something you had to work for. If you're not committed to it, nothing happens. And the same thing is true with relationship, with ourselves, with each other, even with God. We may have a very, very powerful spontaneous spiritual experience through the power of grace. But if we don't then commit to the sadhana, and I know this from a personal level. I mean, I had one of those experiences. I did not have a sadhana practice before. I was gifted by grace, this extraordinary experience. And it's incredibly powerful and it lasts a beautiful long time. And then it stops lasting. And then you find yourself back in, you're different. You're different, of course. But you're back in patterns. And you're yearning for that experience that you had had. But you've got to work for it. With commitment. You work to make that a stable way of living. And so whether it's your relationship with yourself, with God, with another person, 
Of course it takes commitment. Absolutely. Any other questions? Yes. Is the dreams we have in the early morning, bad dreams especially, are the alarm for the future or it has happened in sometimes in past? Hmm. Are the, the dreams that we have in the early morning bad dreams? Are they premonitions of the future or things from the past? Well, interestingly, this is actually one of the reasons that a lot of the spiritual traditions of the world emphasize getting up really early. We have what's called a circadian rhythm, which is kind of a 24-hour cycle that our bodies are on. And sleep is part of that. Now, I won't go, I won't go into too many of the details, but it's important to know a little bit, which is we've got basically three types of sleep. We have what we call deep sleep, which is the really restorative sleep. It's the sleep there's no dreams. It's just deep sleep. Everything is gone. It's the most restorative and healing for the body. We then have light sleep. And we have dream sleep. What's called REM sleep. Now here's what's interesting. The later at night, the more of your sleep is spent in dream sleep. So if you sleep, let's say you sleep even eight hours, as we're told we should. But you sleep those eight hours from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. Or even 10 p.m. to 6 a.m you're going to spend fewer hours in dream sleep than if you go to sleep at 1 and you sleep till 9. Now, that has an impact on your mind and also on your body because we need the deep sleep to restore. But the later you go to sleep at night, actually the less of a percentage of your time spent asleep is in deep sleep and more is in dream sleep. Which is why a lot of times, even if we get seven, eight long hours of sleep, if we've gone to sleep really late and we've slept really late in the morning, we don't feel refreshed. Whereas if you go to sleep early, you may discover, oh, I don't actually need seven or eight hours. I can get by on five, six hours because those hours are filled with so much more deep restorative sleep. And you're right, most of the dreams come in those morning hours. Early morning to mid-morning to late morning, depending on how long you end up staying asleep. The more you start having those dreams, is sort of a signal to, all right, get up. Like now is the time, you're, you're done, you've gotten the restoration that you need. Get up. That being said, dreams, when we have them and when we remember them, can also be very powerful tools of insight. They're definitely not something to take as a premonition. Sometimes, occasionally, we see something in a dream and then it happens. A lot of times, all the dreams are, and actually this is why they are beneficial, is they help our subconscious mind kind of sort through and make sense of the input that we took in during the day. So if you watch certain TV shows, or if you watch movies, you watch news, you're reading a certain type of book, or you're having certain types of conversations, those are the things that are going to go in your dreams, right? I mean, you watch a movie before you go to sleep, there's a really good chance that you're going to see in your dream something related to the movie or the actors or the characters. So the dreams in a lot of ways are just us siphoning through 
all of the input that's come into our subconscious. Karmically, interestingly, sometimes, people sometimes get very afraid if they see a bad dream, a scary dream. And interestingly, sometimes what it is is actually a really good sign because let's say that karmically in your destiny is written that there's going to be an accident. Now maybe that was actually going to be some kind of a very tragic, devastating, maybe even fatal accident of a car or motorcycle, whatever it may be. But then you have a dream of being in a car accident. And it's said that actually this happens a lot through grace, grace of God, grace of a guru, through doing a lot of sadhana, through repentance, through things that actually can interact with our karmic package. And now it's not that it obliterates the karma, but now instead of actually having a car accident in my life, I have one in my dream. And that karma is done. So my suggestion regarding dreams is always, first of all, try to sleep as early in the night as you can. But second of all, if you do have dreams and you remember them, ask yourself, what does it mean to you? Because remember, it's your subconscious talking to you. So there's lots of different schools of dream interpretation, Western, Eastern, modern, older. But ultimately at the core, it's what are you trying to tell yourself? You know your inner subconscious much more up close and personal. been a philosopher or a psychologist, somebody talking about dream symbols may. So just ask yourself in your meditation, okay, oh God, you know, give me some guidance. What does this mean? And if you see something bad in a dream, just, just pray, offer it to God. Okay, thank you so much for making this happen in a dream instead of in real life. And if it's something that you can avoid, I mean, if you do see something about a car accident, for example, take it as a message. Make sure to buckle up. Drive safely, right? I mean, I take everything as a message from God. There's no equation. There's no scientific way of knowing this car accident I saw as a dream is a premonition or it's my karma clearing it or it's just because of a movie I saw. There's no way of knowing. So take it as a message. Buckle up. Drive safely. Be careful. Don't get in the car with someone who's been drinking. Pay attention on the road. And be very grateful that maybe you've had an experience in a dream that now you don't have to go through in life. And ask your subconscious, what does this mean to you? What in my life is crashing? What's crashing in my life? Because remember, a lot of things in dream are symbols. What's crashing? What's the big bang happening in my life? What do I need to learn from that? And just ask yourself. Because inside you, you know the answer. I mean, you created the dream to give the message. So just go deeply and ask yourself and see what comes up. Beautiful. Have a, a beautiful, beautiful rest of your evening. I look so forward to seeing you all tomorrow. For those of you joining us online, have a beautiful morning and day. And we will we'll be having our evening satsangs now each evening after the aarti. So I look so forward to seeing you, seeing you tomorrow. Have a beautiful, beautiful rest of your evening.